Uh, and uh, uh, a great morning to gather some friends uh, around uh, a cup of coffee or, or something stronger. It's not quite the weekend yet, but why not? Uh, for uh, uh, this discussion of um, uh, practitioners' experiences, how to be a good clean tech investor. And we've got uh, an amazing lineup um, to, to help set this up. Um, I'm Jason Switzer. Most of you will know me as the executive director of the Alberta Clean Technology Industry Alliance and uh, backed up by my colleague, Amanda Lowe. <laughs> and uh, we've got an extraordinary panel. Our host for the panel today is Jeanette Jackson, um, CEO of Foresight. Uh, we have Juan Benitez, uh, who in addition to uh, a few other hats is a special advisor to the BDC Industrial Innovation Fund. Uh, and we've got Hannah Goyen, uh, Vice President at McRock Capital. Um, hi, Ha. Thanks. Terrific to have you here as well. We've still got some people coming in. Um, just wanted to let people know, uh, first off, uh, please remain on mute to uh, uh, help out our, our panelists so that there's no uh, sounds of dogs barking in the background while, while, while they're talking. And of course, we will be recording this uh, so that we can post it up on the uh, Actia podcast uh, so that uh, folks who weren't able to participate will be able to uh, enjoy uh, terrific um, insights that come out of the panel. Really quickly, uh, this VC Masterclass or Clean Tech Investment Masterclass uh, is part of the Alberta Clean Tech Investment Summit. Um, we're organizing with Startup TNT, uh, Foresight, Clean Tech Accelerator Canada, and uh, of course our, our, our good friends at Energy Futures Lab. Um, I'll just say a quick word about that. What is the Investment Summit? Um, a big part of this is building a community of uh, clean tech investors. Um, in the province, as well as introducing some of our uh, terrific ventures to folks who can hopefully help them get through one of the key valleys of death, um, the challenge for clean tech in uh, Canada and globally is securing uh, growth capital, uh, getting through um, a few different stages and uh, by building an, an effective and fast moving investment community in our province, we wanna help Albertans invest in Albertan startups and uh, grow the ecosystem overall. Um, these are the companies that are pitching. So uh, to respond to one of our VCs questions earlier, this is just some of the terrific ventures uh, that are, uh, apply to participate. We've already uh, vetted them down to a top 20. Uh, some great companies here. Uh, I think they all pitched extraordinarily well last week. And I'm really looking forward to hosting the second pitch night uh, this evening, uh, starting at, uh, Gosh, now my head is falling apart, but I think we're starting at 5 p.m. Am I right, Amanda? Yeah, yeah. 5 p.m. Great. Uh, of course, I'm here with Actia, um, representing our, uh, our community of over 130 uh, corporate members, venture members, service providers, and other partners. Um, we're uh, seeing a tremendous wave of enthusiasm for Albertan clean tech and look forward to helping build the ecosystem. Um, of course, we're not alone at this. I'll turn it over to Jeanette to introduce Foresight. Go ahead, Jeanette. Absolutely. Uh, thanks for having me. Great to see everyone on the line this morning. Uh, it's actually cooler in Vancouver than it's ever been, so I can only imagine how the weather is uh, in Alberta. I've heard it's pretty chilly. Uh, Foresight, we are Canada's largest clean tech uh, accelerator. Uh, we support innovators and ventures. Uh, basically ensure they have the right team value prop business model and competitive advantage uh, to build a strong competitive global venture. And then of course, within that, uh, we work with investors and uh, both from the angel community all the way up to uh, venture capital and pension funds to help do that matchmaking uh, to ensure that uh, the companies can be properly capitalized for success. So happy to be here and look forward to, to talking with uh, with Ha and Juan as we navigate uh, some of the tips and tools to become a great investor. Awesome. Thank you, Jeanette. And really great to have you here. It's great to have a partnership with you guys. And we think that there's just so much that we can do here. This being one of the great examples uh, of work that we're doing. I want to also introduce um, our partner, Energy Futures Lab, where CFL is uh, uniquely, I think, Albertan effort to create 
cooperation amongst leaders um, and position uh, Alberta to uh, build the energy system that's future fit, the energy system we need. Uh, and so we're really grateful to EFL for partnering with us, for helping support this process. And through their Social Impact Innovation Fund, um, they're going to be making a $25,000 grant uh, to one of the five finalists uh, on March 11th. I think that's great. Non-dilutive capital to help growth, fantastic. And what's also unique is, is being able to lean in and support ventures through some of the challenges. So uh, I'll stop there. We don't need to uh, stop the share. Um, we don't need to do that anymore. I'm gonna uh, press record. We'll start the panel. A uh, quick thank you to our sponsors, Enternext, um, Western Economic Diversification Canada, uh, others joining us besides. So um, with that, uh, over to Jeanette, I'm gonna start record. Please make sure if you're not speaking that your mics are on mute. Um, and uh, with that, uh, we'll start. Over to you, Jeanette. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Hope you've had a great evening. Uh, it's a great start to the day to be talking about how we can help accelerate the growth of clean tech in Alberta uh, with the innovators and ventures at the core of everything that we do. Uh, we're definitely going to get into having Juan and Ha share all of their great insights and experience. I thought I'd maybe give you a quick overview about myself just because I started out as a clean tech uh, CEO, uh, early stage venture, scaled that up and had a personal exit in 2011. Uh, and then I started to do some dabbling in investments. So I am an angel investor and always trying to navigate what are the different techniques and tools and considerations that are evolving as we look to make investments, not only um, in general technology, but more specifically in clean tech, where there's longer sales cycles and development cycles and other considerations. Of course, over the past several years, we've also actually seen that shorten. So what was traditionally seven, 10 years to get to market, there's really an acceleration on that front as well. So how can we help you sort of have the, the information and the frameworks that you need to make good investment decisions on your own, on your own behalf? So that's a little bit about me. Uh, I'm now actually gonna pass it right over to Juan and Ha to introduce themselves, give a little bit of background on how they became involved in investing in, in clean tech. And uh, perhaps we'll kick it off with you, Ha. Please introduce yourself. Awesome. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining. Uh, really glad to meet you guys on here. Um, so I'm Ha Nguyen, and uh, I am a vice president at Macro Capital. And we are a venture capital firm that focuses on a space that we call the industrial IoT or industry 4.0. Um, and it is all about creating that foundation of data on the physical environment and use digital technologies to make sense of the data uh, and make smarter decisions. Um, and the application of it is, can be seen in a wide range of industrial markets of which energy is, is a major theme for us. Because of the overlap um, in vertical markets, um, many opportunities and challenges we see with industrial companies overall also apply for clean tech startups um, that, that we look at. And we've been looking into um, specifically uh, digital solutions that have optimized the asset uh, for wind and solar infrastructures, as well as electrification technologies um, such as EV and software and hardware plays that have optimized energy consumption for industrial and commercial facilities. I would say that um, the clean tech angle that we approach here is more on the digital side and it kind of intertwines um, with a part of the whole IoT theme that we have. So that's how we got involved. Thank you. Thanks, Ha. Juan, over to you. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, great to be here. It's uh, nice and warm in my office as opposed to outside here. Um, yeah, so I, I'm a venture partner with the uh, BDC's uh, Industrial Innovation Fund, uh, and, they, and they were set up to support uh, three core industries, I guess, in Canada to leverage uh, or strengthen those industries to develop technologies uh, and build global companies. Uh, and those three are uh, ag tech or agriculture. The other one is extractive, which typically deals with uh, mining and oil and gas. Uh, and then we also invest in advanced manufacturing, which uh, cuts across uh, all three, uh, well, it cuts across all sectors, really, when you think about it. 
Um, how, how did I get to be a, a clean tech investor? I, I actually started my career out as an environmental engineer, uh, assessing and cleaning up contaminated sites. And after doing that for a bunch of years, I decided that uh, rather than being uh, the janitor, it would be nice to uh, build some technologies that uh, maybe could prevent some, some environmental uh, issues from occurring in the first place on a more systemic basis. And so I did, I had a software company uh, that did that. It, it was one of the first SaaS companies to do inspections of industrial sites and uh, find issues and corrective actions and all of that. And then I moved into Synovus and that's where I actually got into the clean tech investment side uh, where we were looking for clean tech to improve the environmental performance of uh, the industry as a whole. That's where I met Jason as well. Um, I got to say one of the coolest, uh, while I did a lot of process tech and interesting stuff, the coolest one was when I got to uh, sit on the board of General Fusion, which is uh, the ultimate clean tech investment if you ever get a chance to, to uh, check that. Uh, facility out, but touring their facility was uh, for me entering an entire uh, new universe uh, where you just have it just blows you away. So I love the uh, the clean tech sector. Uh, it goes to the core of what I uh, believe. And uh, anyway, that's uh, that's how I got into the clean tech world. Awesome. Thanks, Juan. Uh, if folks do have questions, please enter them in the chat and I'll be able to, to get to a few of them in a bit here. Um, so how back to you, you talked a little bit about sort of the IoT digital component of the work that McRock's doing. Is that 100% aligned with your current investment thesis or do you want to expand on that thesis a little bit? It, it is. So, um, you know, from a, from a sector standpoint, um, as a digital focused investor, um, I would have to say we we don't shy away from hardware and and in fact our portfolio has a good mix of hardware and software companies uh, for both fund one and fund two. Um, over the past ten years, um, it, it it has been about the generating data from machines and devices and and physical environment and accessing it. And we believe the most significant and disruptive stage of the industrial 4.0 um, evolution will is is really you know comes when it's really coming when the analytics power by ai and machine learning um allow machines and the physical work to kind of sense and comprehend and act and learn and so the power of intelligence system will help optimize industrial operations and reduce emissions in mining oil and gas manufacturing and other carbon intensive sectors. And so the whole investment thesis in context of sustainability or clean tech is about leveraging data and automation to reduce environmental uh, footprints. It is, it is the whole investment thesis for us. Awesome, thanks Ha. And Juan, you covered uh, ag tech, extractive technologies, advanced manufacturing. Do you wanna give a little bit deeper uh, insight into, into that investment thesis? A few more comments there? Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll start with ag tech um, specifically. So with ag tech, uh, there's certainly uh, efficiency plays to, to be made in ag tech, but there's also a huge sustainability component and it's a huge sustainability momentum happening in that sector uh, in Canada and globally. So we invest in companies, for example, uh, we invest in Seoul Cuisine who uh, focuses on plant-based proteins because, uh, as we all know, um, animal-based proteins can generate a lot of uh, environmental, uh, you know, consequences, uh, methane and and uh, land use, etc. Um, so we we take a, a broader view. Certainly, we overlap with with uh, McRock and Ha. We we uh, often talk deals together because we're definitely. Uh, in a way serving the same spaces, just slightly differently. Um, with oil and gas and, and mining, um, there's lots of uh, uh, things that can be done. They're both industrial uh, sectors that certainly have their share of environmental challenges. Uh, and there's a lot of things that, uh, that can be done differently from a clean tech perspective, certainly reducing uh, emissions uh, from them. But also, for example, in, in, uh, in mining, we invest in a company called MindSense, 
Uh, and the idea there was to minimize uh, the amount of uh, handling and GHGs that goes with handling by doing sorting at the mine face instead of uh, you know later on down the, down the process. And advanced manufacturing really makes uh, cuts across the board. It, it can do. Uh, you can have manufacturing of more efficient heating systems, cooling systems, uh, better better controls for existing processes. Uh, but again, uh, you know the clean tech component is always uh, super important because we do serve industrial sectors. Um, we're we're not we're not necessarily tied to you know software we we definitely are not afraid of doing hardware plays we're not even afraid to do uh, process uh, type technologies either uh, which we can talk a little bit about later uh, they're more challenging of course as you probably all know so yeah and the and the idea is we have these uh, very strong sectors in Canada which we can leverage to build technologies, build companies, and take them global uh, and improve our own sectors while also building up these global companies. And that's, that's the thesis of the fund. That's perfect. That's perfect. Let's dive in a little more into sort of how you go about selecting viable ventures. Um, I'd also love to get your opinion on sort of the more incremental opportunities versus the more transformational stuff. So Juan, you mentioned General Fusion. Uh, that's a big play. And then you've got sort of the more incremental stuff and, and there's investment opportunities across the whole scale there. So how do you select uh, viable ventures and, and what's your perspective on, on that sort of range of incremental versus transformational? I'll pass it to Juan first, yeah. Okay. Um, you, well, you know, whether it's incremental or transformational, um, that's certainly a consideration, but end of the day, uh, we're, we're a financial fund and we look for the same things that every other fund looks like. We look for, uh, you know, businesses that are good businesses. Uh, if they're doing clean tech, uh, if they have to be viable businesses, otherwise, uh, they're not sustainable and, and their missions will not be, uh, accomplished. So number one, we, we look at the same things that everybody else looks at. We look at their markets, their value proposition to their, their customers, because um, if they don't have a good value proposition, then there's gonna be no market uptake. They're not gonna be able to get financed uh, and things like that. Um, so we, we really, the clean tech angle is, is super important, but more important is basic fundamental principles as to are they solving a problem that needs to be solved uh, and, and things like that. Uh, the, the, the thing that is probably a little bit different in clean tech than maybe uh, with some of the solutions, not all, usually the process solutions, uh, what we look for a lot is uh, some of these uh, process technologies that require certain specialized equipment and plants, they can take a long time to, to get to a commercial scale. And so one of the things we, we really have to look at is, you know, uh, can they achieve what they need to achieve uh, on a commercial basis within the lifetime of a, of a 10 year fund? And then of course, as the fund progresses in time, that'll become more and more of a challenge uh, for the fund. So those are, um, uh, but other than that, we look for good teams, we look for experience, we look for uh, uh, partnerships, how much industry uh, uh, pull is there for their, uh, and support is there for their technologies, uh, all of that. So it, I, I, I'll, I'll leave it at that, but that's basically how we, we look at that. Awesome. Well, what do you think? Yeah, I, I'll chime in to what uh, Juan said um, with a couple of points. So I think, you know, apart from everything that he, he rightly said, um, a couple of other things that we look at, uh, the first is around the management team. So we would like to see a balance of tech expertise, but also commercial expertise. Um, somebody who understand the nuances of the market segment that you sell your product for. Um, if you are a PhD with a really cool piece of technology, I would encourage you to find a co-founder with domain knowledge on the vertical markets that you want to pursue. Domain expertise is what turns the technology into a sellable solution and then a scalable business. 
Um, and the second thing is also, you know, um, kind of around that incremental versus transformational technologies. Um, we love transformational technology, but we all know that, you know, one of the problem with clean tech in the early, trend, uh, early 2000 years too, is that a lot of, of, of things that they create to replace uh, fossil fuel could not reach a, a scale because they cannot produce it at a lower price than fossil fuel. Um, and so uh, it is also around the business model and how quickly the solution could become cheap enough for mass adoption. Um, and so, you know, all this technology in the early 2000s, it, it forever stay in the labs and never see, really see the light of day for mass production. I think that's, that's some lesson that we need to learn as, as entrepreneurs, but also investors from that. Um, and finding the right business model to scale is, is never an easy task. Um, and, and so I think, you know, for the second wave of clean tech and sustainability here, investor will look way more into those who kind of understand well enough the market mechanism to come up with a sustainable revenue model to scale. And it is, you know, you probably would not be able to come up with a, with a disruptive transformational solution right away. Um, so it's going to be a sequencing of steps to approach the market. Um, and the, the, the last one is also, kind of, I think Juan mentioned it a little bit as well, is around capital e efficiency. Um, investors have been burned in the past um, by those clean tech companies that had large capital needs and experienced substantial monthly burn rates. And so today, clean tech startups typically need to show what they can be, that they can be capital efficient and not require huge ongoing infusions of cash to become successful. And in some cases, it means that starting with an initial product or service whose profit can sustainably fund other initiatives that are key to the corporate mission. So again, coming back to that sequencing thing on, on incremental versus transformational. Yeah, that's super interesting. Two points you made on domain expertise. We see that too. We're really working hard to get that domain expertise into the ventures much more quickly through the accelerator programming. Um, so that's where the industry engagement and, and, and programming and partnerships really come in. And then, of course, the patience piece as well, understanding that, you know, it is a process. And if you look at that traditional graph where it's all squiggly for the entrepreneur's journey, the investors are going along with that journey as well. And so they have to have the stomach to understand that there's going to be things that are moving and changing and ebbing and flowing as the environment changes and as they you know, really determine, like you said, that that optimal path forward from a business model and um, competitive advantage perspective. Yeah. Okay, next uh, questions that I've got here. What is distinct about investing in clean tech versus other tech companies? So, Ha, maybe I'll start with you there. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, I, I part on that kind of patient capital um, and, and, you know, as a startup who kind of look for an investor to fill in, in their cap table, it's really, it's really important to kind of look at where they are in terms of their fund life cycle. Um, so uh, VC fund usually use the first five years of their life cycle. So in total, there's a 10 year life cycle. Um, they, they usually use the first five years to make investment and the, and the next five years to kind of, you know, do portfolio management and prepare for, for exit. So if you meet a, a venture capital fund that are at the fifth year of their fund's life cycle, there's going to be, you know, a really high probability that they will be under pressure to exit their position in the next couple of years. Um, and if you are in, let's say, you know, in, in a business that need a little bit longer time to really scale and kind of see, um, you know, that kind of mass adoption, you don't want to get that kind of pressure with you uh, when you build your business. Um, and so patient capital is one thing uh, that's different from the other, the other space. The other side of it is um, in clean tech, regulation matters. Energy is the field that um, is led by regulatory reforms um, such as carbon mandates, carbon taxes, energy rebates and emission goals and so on and so forth. So the ability to sell to regulated utility poses a challenge that not every startup can handle. Um, it means that also the VC who wish to succeed in this industry need to both understand the way regulations developed as well as need to be able to help entrepreneurs deal with the sales to power stations and transmissions companies. And so regulation is the, is the second thing that I, I find really distinctive with this industry that we cannot find in any other, in any other uh, sectors. Thanks, huh? Juan, what about you? 
Um, yeah, I'll, I'll uh, layer on to that. The, uh, on top of regulations, uh, oftentimes, and we've seen it in the past, there's a lot of subsidies that are given to certain sectors and, and companies rely on those subsidies uh, it's sometimes indefinitely throughout their, their business. And that's a, dangerous, uh, that's a dangerous place to be because if the subsidies goes away, uh, they don't have a real business. So we look for companies that can certainly leverage something like a subsidy, uh, but only through the short term while they get through uh, a certain phase of their, their business. Uh, and to Ha's point, um, in terms of a lot of the clean tech that I've seen, uh, the process technologies require a lot of patient capital uh, and they take, they take uh, a lot of capital and time at the front end. But what, uh, and I have a personal uh, experience with one company, what, what also happens is down the road, oftentimes they require uh, huge capital uh, for CapEx for building plants and building facilities. Uh, I know Jason mentioned carbon engineering. When you, when you look at how much money has gone into uh, something like that, the, the, the process and the chemistry, uh, they figured that out a long time ago, but to scale it to a plant size uh, level takes huge capital and it's, and it's beyond venture capital for the most part uh, to, to do that. So you have to make sure that there's a pathway for these companies to move into the next layer of capital, if you will, uh, so that they can they can be commercialized at, at scale. So there's um, it's not like a software company where you can you know build a piece of software and you can uh, incorporate it into a maybe a bigger platform and exercise and, and exit. Uh, there's there's added layers of complexity due to scale and just the complex nature of some of the. Uh, uh, the types of companies that come out of that come out of clean tech. Awesome, that's very helpful. Um, just for those on the line, I did insert a link to uh, a Village Capital um, framework. It it, it lo basically looks at ventures across eight variables, and then kind of gives some guidelines on what stage of investment they're really at. Um, uh, but this does sort of lean into the next question. Um, in your views, what constitutes a good angel investor? You know, keeping in mind that the angel investor is often the, the first stage of the investment process or journey. And then, you know, the, the later stage investors have to work with the angel investors in those ventures. And so, um, you know, uh, we're going to put everything on the table this morning, but uh, perhaps Juan, I'll pass it over to you to start. What constitutes a good angel investor and, and makes it nice for you to work with those ventures uh, as a possible? Uh, I, I, um, a good angel investor, in my opinion, is somebody who has uh, the best angel investors typically are the ones who've been through the cycle. They've been an entrepreneur themselves. They've had venture capital themselves. Uh, they know they know what it is to do to do a startup and they understand the process. They understand how it progresses to venture capital and other types of capital. Um, they're also, uh, hopefully they're, they come from the sector and they have good networks. Uh, they have good advice for, for the teams. Uh, oftentimes they can even uh, fill a gap in, in uh, knowledge of the management team. Those are the, those are the best uh, angel investors. Uh, the ones that are good angel investors, but sometimes can be super challenging are executives who are retired, who made a boatload of money, they work for large, large corporations. Uh, they're well-intentioned, but they don't understand the, the whole entrepreneurial process. And so they, they can be a little bit challenging uh, sometimes because they don't understand how, how little companies uh, work. So I think, yeah, so that, that's... That's fair. <laughs> and how yeah. are your thoughts? <laughs> Yeah, I agree with Juan 100% on, on the point that, you know, you need to have an angel investor that have some level of involvement um, in the startup community um, in his past life. Either he's a serious entrepreneur or he was with a VC fund. At least he needs to kind of understand the daily challenge of, this, of the startup. Um, and a couple of, you know, other characteristics that I, that I see um, with the angel investor that I really respect and, and know well is the first is that they have patience. Um, again, you know, coming back to the point on VC, 
uh, when you invest at an even earlier stage, um, there's, there's a lot of things going to happen. Idea need time to develop. Product can change during execution. Execution is mostly imperfect um, and markets are hard. And so a good investor is one that is able to trust um, his or her instinct and people in tough time as well as know how to cut losses as soon as possible if, if something bad happens. Um, and then, you know, learnability is also another characteristic of the angel investor that, that we see, um, that we respect. Um, you know, past experience is, is really powerful, but it also can become incumbent um, if you cannot see the world through fresh eyes. So a good angel investor is cognizant of his biases and, and needs to have the ability to take new information and feedback from the, the founders and the markets and the ecosystem players as well. Um, so yeah, and I mean, you know, we, we in terms of the cap table, um, we see the bad thing happen to the cap table before with, in, with angel investors. Um, I do know that, you know, it is really flattering for you if you come to the market and you have 20 people who want to put money into your company, but as investor at a later stage, We'd be really mindful if we see a cap table with more than a hundred rows, with everyone's, you know, take a just live, little different pieces of the company because it's gonna be really, really hard um, every time when you when you need to make a decision uh, that needs the shareholder approval. So be yeah, mindful yeah, of that. Mine, right? I, <laughs> yeah. I, I remember myself. Um, I mean, we didn't go as far as hundred, but we had about thirty. And that, you know, you're about to close that series A round and you're, yeah. you're like, where is that person? I mean, hopefully they exactly. haven't passed away I, because, you, you know, then you then you're delayed weeks. Right. And time is of the essence um, with all of with all of these functions. Exactly. Um, moving on a little bit, we had a question and I'm going to massage it a little bit. But, you know, when we're when you're doing your due diligence you know, what constitutes proof of demand for these technologies and innovations? I know there was a later part of that that um, highlighted technologies that do not exist yet. And I'd love to banter with you, Marty, on, on a bit of that. But let's say there is a venture, it's doing something new, it hasn't been done before. What is the What are the proof of demand points on the due diligence process that uh, these, these folks can, can look for? Oh, ha, huh? over to you first. Yeah, I'm okay. going back and forth. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so yeah, so we are we we are this um, the investor that invests in kind of series A or later stage. Um, and so what we usually look for um, is you know companies that are kind of get past that early phase of market validations and kind of you know generating revenue. So for us, it's, the process is really you know if you have a couple of pilots going on, we're gonna we're gonna go and talk to the customers um, and the early kind of adopter of your technologies and understand. If this is something that is, you know, just a just an innovation kind of innovation lab initiative, or it, it is really something that you can actually take from the R and D into the mass production. And so our problem with the company in that particular stage is really less about if there's a market exists for that. It's really more about, you know, if the demand is high enough um, to kind of scale it from from one sector to the next and from one company to the next. Um, and, you know, back in the, the early days of clean tech, we didn't really have an ecosystem. We didn't really have lots of investor kind of later stage VC put a lot of money into the space, but we didn't have, you know, the, um, the foresight of the world or the actia of the world, um, or we didn't even have experienced angel investors, but now we do, we actually have it. And so we're going to be, um, as a, a later stage investor, we're going to be relying on, you know, these guys, the actia and foresight. Um, and get the domain expertise from them to understand, you know, what it means for this company, you know, with their transformational um, technologies, uh, what does it take and, and what their opinion about if there's really a, a large market for it, you know, besides the customers uh, references that we have. That's perfect. Thanks, Ha. Juan, what do you think? Yeah, and, and uh, 100%. And I would add to that, um, one of the lessons I've learned is uh, a lot of large companies can be uh, early adopters. They can, uh, they're, they're just trying lots of things out in the market, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are the, the more challenging customers. So one of the things that, that we'll do as well is we'll talk to the customers that they don't have yet. Maybe the ones that are the, uh, like in the oil industry, everybody rushes to be second, right? To adopt second. So we'll talk to some of the, uh, the, the second tier 
to see what they think. Um, whether whether the, the technology does it in a completely different way or not um, is not as important as are they solving a problem that people really want solved. Uh, and then of course, you do, you do your due diligence on the technology to see if what they're actually proposing to do is, is realistic or not. But yeah. uh, so we don't just look at the early adopters. Um, uh, we look at some, maybe some of the more challenging uh, companies to see what they think about it. Would they adopt this thing? Yeah, some of the things that I've looked for, you know, even just letters of intent and, and you know, a strong pipeline. And it, I mean, at the end of the day, there's a traditional sales cycle that is incorporated into this whole, into their broader, you know, clean tech and sustainability and high impact vision that they've got. So um, no, that's very, that's very helpful. Um, next question I'm going to move on to is more about sort of lessons that you've learned along the way. Um, Juan, perhaps we'll start with you. What are one or two lessons um, as an investor that you would want to share? Um, perhaps it's a, a failure or a success or an opportunity that you missed out on. Um, a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> I missed out on a lot of opportunities and, and these days we're missing out on even more because the valuations are so high. We'll see how it all pans out in a few years. Um, one of the lessons I learned, and I learned this at Synovus uh, in the early days, was uh, certain, certain technologies just take uh, a lot longer than entrepreneurs realize and they take a lot more money uh, to, to get off the ground than people realize. And, and what can happen is they set unrealistic expectations uh, with their early investors and, and so on and so forth. Uh, they, don't, they don't achieve the milestones in a, in a timely enough manner. And so uh, even good businesses that could eventually succeed uh, will fail. So you really have to um, kind of be uh, the realist when you when you talk to entrepreneurs and say, listen, we look at a lot of Kaha and I will look at a few hundred companies a year. We, we you know, we're not experts in your space, but we understand how these things work. Um, and so, you know, one of the um, one of the prime examples um, that we had uh, was a company called Skyonic that Synovus had invested in. And they were basically pulling CO2 uh, out of a, a effluent or a, a stack, a cement uh, plant stack, and they were converting it into hydrochloric acid and uh, and baking soda, basically. And you know, chemistry-wise, it's not terribly hard to do. But when they were trying to do it at a plant scale, I mean, the, the complexities were just huge. And eventually, they just ran out of time and money. And uh, that was one of those early day clean tech, massive investments. Um, but uh, we've had really, uh, I, I could talk about some successes. Like we, we invest in a company out of Vancouver called Saltworks, uh, really focused team. You know, they really knew how to scale. Uh, it, was, it was process based really, but they, they just were very, very strict in their milestones and, and and they've done super super well uh they they didn't go crazy spending money building you know lots of stuff uh they were very methodical so you can you can get through uh through a complex company uh just by being very disciplined uh, and they engage a lot of industry as well which is very important in clean tech yeah, that's super interesting. Ben and I, I remember when he started Saltworks and I had a different venture. We were both at those pitch events like this. So fast forward um, 12, 13 years, uh, we still laugh um, at the first time we met and shook hands because we were both going for a prize. So we were <laughs> against each other. Um, and Ben's, uh, Ben's uh, glorious. So that's great. Yeah. Paul, what are your thoughts on the question there in terms of lessons? Yeah, I, I do have a I do have a lesson, and, and it's 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 less about um, clean tech, but more on kind of you know startup overall. And 
it, it was back in the time when I was in Vietnam. So I've been in the VC industry for uh, more than 10 years now. And I started in, in investing in startup in, in Southeast Asia. And at that time, I was with a, a venture capital fund called IDG Ventures. And we incubated a company in the e-commerce space. Um, you know, e-commerce is way less sophisticated in terms of technical requirements uh, compared to clean tech. But in terms of you know, cash burn and capital intensive, it's just as crazy as clean tech. Um, and it was around the time of 2013 and 14 when e-commerce just started to boom in Southeast Asia. And uh, the company that we incubated um, had impressive growth um, during the first few years of the launch. Um, they doubled the triple the revenue every year. And they were poised to be really the market leader at that time um, in Southeast Asia um, with, in terms of e-commerce. And so to, to further fuel the growth of the company, uh, we kind of put together a really big financing for them. Although at the time, you know, um, the management team didn't really have that much of an idea. Like they, they do know that they, they need, you know, around five to 10 million, but they always thought that more money would be better for them and it would have them grow faster. And uh, we attract participation from a German and a Russian investors. And the syndicate decided to make um, investment in chances. Although the deal, the, the route side that we're targeting is around 60 million, six zero. It's a, it's a really big financing. And then the syndicate, um, when we put the first tranches um, of, of 20 million into the company, everyone was excited. We thought that the money comes in, will naturally unlock for the role and eventually translate into profitability for, for the company. And we kind of overlook a little bit one angle that um, that was really critical. Um, the company had strong top line growth at that point, but not necessarily had a good financial system and governance in place. Um, and they spent a lot of money in marketing without, without being able to optimize the operations. Um, and the money came in and <clears throat> it was not really proper, properly managed and controlled. And it was, it was just within a year, they burned through that $20 million um, with lots of holes in operations and organization. And at some point, they couldn't even meet the payment application to the, uh, with the vendors. And so lots of dramas happened during that time. And I'm just oversimplifying the story a little bit here, but um, within a year, they came from a high growth startup to a company that was in the brink of bankruptcy. And capital injection should have been the fill, and instead it, be, it became somewhat the poison to the company. And we're still lucky at that time that we put the money in, in tranches, um, and, but it took another considerable, uh, another significant amount of capital after that to just you know, fix the situation, implementing proper control in governments and get the company back on track again. And so one of the biggest lessons that I, that I learned very early day at that point in time was that raising too much capital, um, much, too much money is often the enemy of startups. Because um, raising too much capital always leads to spending too much. You hire too quickly, your cultures will suffer, your process will quick, and your, your customer acquisition cost will increase. And then it forces panic, and it forces job cuts, and belt tightening, and inside rounds, and buckling down to prove your worth, because you raise at a very high valuation at that point in time. I do think that having limited resources will lead founders to make hard choices about what you want to build and what you want. And it will unleash kind of creativity across the whole organization. So, you know, it forces you to invest in company culture rather than just, you know, free breakfast. And so that's, that's one of the biggest lessons I learned back in the time. And Yuan, I know you want to chime in on, on that too. Yeah, yeah, I want to I wanna add that because um, that just reminded me of a couple of deals I looked at last year. It's from our perspective, it's super, we, we deal with cash burn. That's the life. That's what we fund. We fund cash burn. Uh, but sometimes you need to really dig deep to figure out what the source of that cash burn is. <laughs> to your point, huh? Why are you burning cash? Why are you growing like crazy and still burning cash? Uh, and sometimes the, the answer surprises you <laughs> and it's a, a little <laughs> shocking. It's that uh, horror story of the large, let's, no, I'd say less on clean tech because they're so capital intense, but the big software companies, you know, they close a 50 million round and then there's a new plane on the runway. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard a few of those stories. It's like, whoo. Yeah, you, you go to your first board meeting and everybody's got a new Mac on their desk, right? A new MacBook Pro, new monitor. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway. Lean, I, I've ha I have heard like, you know, um, uh, oh, we were talking about um, sort of uh, 
Amazon and sort of how that whole scale up um, happened. And, you know, when Amazon went through its ups and downs, which it did, uh, you know, they went to the extreme of uh, unplugging light bulbs in vending machines to save power. I mean, and so that's what encouraged the investors to continue, yeah. you know, on because that culture of nimble and uh, scrappy, I like to use that word right, right now, um, whatever it takes to get to that milestone with that investment, you know, st stakeholder in mind, right? And of course, there's other stakeholders, you know, team first, then customers, then investors, unfortunately. But if that ripple effect doesn't carry through, then, you know, there's a bit of a red flag there. Exactly. And I mean, you know, um, the reason why I bring that that story out is, is because I feel like we are also in somewhat of a heated market right now, um, especially around sustainability and clean tech. And there's so many new investors will get into the space that we call the tourists. Um, you know, they, they basically are general investors, but you know, because the, the sector is too hot, they want to just take a, a pie on that. And it will um, naturally drive valuation and competition up. Um, and so, you know, if you are doing something really well and you got a lot of um, interest from investors, you need to really think hard about, you know, if you should take that money um, that is being offered to you and at what cost and what you're going to do with that to maximize, um, you know, your top line and bottom line. And so, yeah. And so, you know, I mean, interesting time that we're living in. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, and, and get money from the right investor. Like exactly. there is a lot of money. Uh, there is a lot of money for growth companies right now, but not all money is created equal, right? And, and Ha mentioned it earlier, you need to get money from the right investors with the right networks in your space that can help you grow your company. There's lots of money, but it's not all created equal. Exactly. Let's move on to a question regarding the entrepreneurs. So I myself being a little bit of an entrepreneur as well, I remember doing my rounds and I had feedback later on. Um, one of the mistakes I made is I kind of tried to know everything or at least come across like I knew all the answers that just because I thought that was what was going to instill confidence in the investor. But um, so one of the things I would say in terms of mistakes that entrepreneurs make is they they try to make it look like they know everything and it's okay not to know everything and just say, let me get, think about that and get back to you. I haven't, that's a good question. I haven't thought about that. But, you know, from your perspective, Ha, huh, and then we'll move on to you, uh, Juan, what uh, mistakes do entrepreneurs make when they first meet you or as they're going through the due diligence process? Yeah, I think, you know, it's uh, from the from the first meeting to to kind of the close of the deal and, you know, up, I, on the way to, you know, the exit, it's always like a marriage or, you know, you know, the, the due diligence process is where you you kind of date. Right. And so, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs at like coming back to your project, um, you know, trying to show confidence by, you know, showing that they know everything and and everything about, you know, their market um, and their and, and their business is is perfect. And it's, it's really kind of, you know, backfire a, li a little bit for us. We like to see entrepreneurs who say, OK, there's challenge in this market, but we're going to fix that challenge by this and this. And so you being really aware of the opportunities, but also the challenges. And um, a couple of, and, and the other thing that we've seen um, to, you know, a couple of like kind of more local entrepreneurs that we see is that you haven't done enough research at the global scale on your competitions and the market. And so, um, you know, I often meet com uh, entrepreneurs who say, you know, we are the only one who, who do that. But in fact, we've seen, you know, an another 10 Israeli guy or US guy who already do that. And so it's, if you cannot articulate and if you cannot educate us about, you know, the market that you are in within, you know, the emerging competitors that you have, not just incumbents, everyone is talking about incumbents and how they, how they meet the incumbents, but the emerging competitors are really strong forces as well. They're just as innovative as you are. And probably you know more like better funded as uh, more than you. So it's it's really important to understand the the competition and the market at the global scale. Um, I mean you know there's always kind of you know thing that kind of make us being turned off a little bit during the the dates. I one of the things that I would strongly advise again uh, to entrepreneurs is never put valuation expectation on your 
on your pitch deck and don't don't talk about it in the first meeting. And if if the investor bring it up, let's say it's up for negotiation, because you know at the couple first meeting they don't like you enough. Let's make them love you first before you know you bring up the the bargain. Um, that's one of the lesson that we kind of learn, you know, uh, for you know our, our own portfolio company as well uh, when they do fundraising. That's great, Juan. What do you think? Yeah, hundred uh, percent. With all of that, I would uh, add to that that um, I look for a few things: uh, coachability in terms of uh, is this somebody who uh, is is a coachable person, right? Especially in a startup because they're going to go through a huge growth phase. Um, so, and a lot of entrepreneurs also look at investors as just an investor, and and they don't understand that they the investor really becomes the business partner. And, and uh, it's, they're part of the process of growing that company. And, and the ones that, that just treat investors and they only are nice to them when they need the next round of capital, uh, they, don't, they don't do well. And then one other point I would add is, uh, I, I'm very leery of uh, startup entrepreneurs who try to do everything themselves and they don't put a plan in place to, to fill the gaps in their team as they grow the company. Um, where they, they try to be all things to all people, which is kind of what your earlier point was, Jeanette. They think they, they try to show that they know everything about everything. You know, every, there's a lot of specialties in business. There's CFOs and operations people and all of that. And the good entrepreneurs understand that they need to be the, the, uh, the conductor of that orchestra and get all the pieces to work. And they don't have to uh, be the most knowledgeable person on any particular topic. So those are the things that, that you look for. Um, you look for somebody who can grow, uh, who's coachable, who can grow, who, who's open. Um, and, and, and that type of a personality usually does quite, quite well. Yeah, no, that's helpful. I'm gonna try to get in a few quick questions from the audience here. Um, maybe we'll do a bit of a rapid fire. Um, Juan and, and then Ha, what's the lowest TRL you've invested in? Uh, and maybe what tips would you give the angel community being a little bit uh, before that? Uh, I would say uh, a TRL four. And I like to see a, uh, a fairly well-defined path to uh, an MVP that you can try at a commercial scale. Great. Huh? Yeah, I, I'll say it, it's the same for, it's the same with us. Uh, we'd like to see a really clear path uh, to commercial scale. Great. Um, another question, given the timeline of technology such as nuclear fusion, how does an early stage investor engage in, a, in, a, in an opportunity like that? Ha, huh? and then one. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, they need to be mindful of, uh, again, where they are in the fund life cycle. And if they are a, an evergreen fund or if they are a traditional VC with a 10 years life cycle, um, you know, there's a lot of different ways to exit these days as well. Um, you either, you know, come invest really early and then sell your position to a larger fund, um, you know, but, you know, you need to really think about it, um, knowing that, you know, it's, it's going to take you more than 10 years to, to kind of realize it in a traditional kind of exit pathway like IPO or, or M&A. Great. Juan, what do you think? Yeah, if you're not prepared to, uh, to be in it for the long haul, um, then don't invest in that stage. Uh, it's just the way it is. And be prepared for a lot of uncertainty. Absolutely. Um, let's get into some terms. I mean, the, the angel often sets the terms uh, for follow-on uh, uh, investments. What are some of the terms that later stage VCs don't like to see? Juan and then Ha. Well, uh, so on a corporate venture perspective, you'll see a lot of terms around right of first refusal for uh, buying the company. Those are company killers. Uh, royalty arrangements where, you know, they get a royalty on every piece of product that's ever sold. So that's from the corporate side. Uh, other terms are when uh, they, they have certain exclusivity terms uh, that don't really align with the amount of capital that they put in. And uh, they're not willing to let those go uh, when the, the, the more institutional money comes in and they makes companies unfundable. Yeah, another thing that I chime in is that is the valuation cap. It, it, used to be, it used not to be a problem, but it has been a problem these days just because you know, the valuation cap and the expectation on new money 
uh, valuation is, re is really, really broad. So we've seen company with a 20 million valuation cap and they expect a new money coming in for $80 million. And so, you know, you have to come in with the same, at the same round with these guys with $20 million. And then they put in, you know, 5 million. So one half of the, half of the kind of total round, it's going to be really hard for the investor to navigate through that from a, a return standpoint. Yeah, that's great. One more question and then we'll play a quick game. Um, any specific trend that you're seeing that's of interest to you, you know, maybe outside of your own thesis and, and, um, and VC group, ha, and then one. Yeah, I, I, I love, I would say, you know, electrification and autonomous uh, when it comes to kind of vehicles and how people move around the city. So it's about, it's around mobility. I think it's going to be, it's going to be a really impactful trend. It's not from, you know, an industry standpoint, but also a kind of lifestyle standpoint. Juan? Yeah, I, I'm seeing a version 2.0 of the hydrogen uh, play. I, I, every day I seem to read more and more articles about green hydrogen, blue hydrogen, hydrogen schemes. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. I, I think production of hydrogen is one thing, but if there's no uh, demand pull on the other side and an infrastructure to actually use it, uh, we'll see how it all plays out. But that's, that's the latest one. Lots of hydrogen these days. Awesome. Okay, the quick game is bull or bear. I'm going to say a, a sector or an, an opportunity, and you can give your thoughts. Hyperloops, Juan. I'd say it's bear. Ha? Huh? Agree. Uh, carbon utilization, ha? Huh? Bull. Agreed, bull. Uh, Juan, uh, cellular agriculture. I think it's bull, but it's nascent right now. Agree. I, I, I work for bull. Uh, last one, geothermal. Ha. Huh. Well, this one is a tough one. Uh, I say it's bear. <laughs> I'd say it's bear, but I'd like to see it bull. I just, it's such an underutilized resource. Agree, but <laughs> it's it challenging. Just, it just doesn't seem to catch catch the the uh the momentum for whatever awesome. reason we are done thank you so much everybody for attending today it's been a pleasure sharing this insights uh ha and one thank you so much uh jason any final comments i know ha has to get out of here quickly so i just want to remind everybody that uh we're hosting a pitch event tonight <clears throat> the uh Final 10 ventures who qualified for our, final, our top 20 at the um, investment summit on March 11th uh, will be pitching tonight in a series of rapid fire pitches. So please join us. Thank you all for joining us. Um, thank you for uh, some amazing facilitation, Jeanette, and uh, both to Juan and Ha. Thank you for giving us your morning. Um, what a great session. We look forward to putting it up on our podcast. Awesome. Thank Thanks, everyone. Have a great morning. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye, everybody.